Hello, my friends. How's it going? Welcome to D&D Optimized, uh, part of the D4 network, the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e, and we crunch numbers about it, and we theorycraft about it, and we uh, you know, do our best to try and build a character that is as powerful as possible for the role that we've chosen for that particular build uh, that week in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters for Dungeons & Dragons almost as much as you enjoy actually playing the game, then welcome home. This is uh, where you belong. So we're super happy to have you. Thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and uh, I'll be your host. Before we jump into the episode this week, uh, just really quick, don't forget uh, to check out Tales of Anaria. Um, session three, here's card number one for the day. Uh, session three airs tomorrow as of this release. And we're super excited. Thanks for those who have been following along. And we hope to get many more of you uh, watching and enjoying the show with us. I, I wanted to mention uh, really quickly, um, I do get occasionally people asking me to um, put out like a cheat sheet for uh, my builds, like a level by level written guide and or um, like a like a D and D Beyond character sheet. Uh, and for those who don't know, just in case you don't know, um, I, I do have the ability to join the channel as a member. And for, for a very small $2 a month, um, you can actually get a written guide or a cheat sheet to each build, which I think is a lot more useful than a like D&D Beyond character sheet. Um, just because it actually tells you kind of how we got there instead of just a here's a level 20 character, which is sort of like, okay, but... What did you do to get here and here and here? It's not as instructive, I don't think. Anyway, primarily it's a great way to support the channel and I'm super grateful for, for thank you to all of our members and for those who have joined. Um, it's really kind of the only thing that I, that I give to try and incentivize people. Hopefully one day I'll be able to expand my offerings. Um, but for right now, uh, it's kind of the only the only thing that I have to, to dangle a carrot <laughs> to help encourage people to join. Um, so anyway, if, if you'd consider supporting us, um, it can really help us put out more content, better quality content, etc. So please consider and thank you. So anyway, um, today we're going to talk about the Undead Warlock that's brand new. Uh, as per Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, it's been in, it was not in Unearthed Arcana for very long. Um, we actually did, uh, we actually did a Slide Into My DMs episode on, uh, on that particular Unearthed Arcana just a couple of months ago, I think. Um, Uh-oh, card number two, here we go. Um, so anyway, check that out if, uh, if you're curious to see what the Unearthed Arcana version looked like. The one thing, though, as I thought about it more and looked at it more, that did seem pretty unique and powerful is the ability that these undead warlocks get to regularly cause fear every turn, or the frightened condition on an enemy. Um, the more I thought about it, the more interested I became. I started thinking about ways to create a build that took this kind of amazing and unique, fairly unique ability and try to get the most out of it, to get the most out of that fear, that frightened condition. What could we do? Um, and I think I came up with something pretty compelling, but it does require some, some pretty heavy investment into another class to really get it where I want it. Um, and so to that end, let me offer a small apology. Um, I confess that the thumbnail and the title for the video today might be just a smidge clickbaity. Um, I, I do get Undead Warlock levels early, but at the beginning, it's really only a dip. It will make sense when we get there, I think, as to why, but it has to do with trying to find ways to get the most out of fear or frightened condition. I think the, the best way to do that requires a heavy investment elsewhere. We do get plenty of great features from that elsewhere that I'll get into here in a minute, but still, just be forewarned. Some of you probably already know where I'm going, but anyway, for those who, who, who play this character until like level nine or 10 or, or earlier, right? A more appropriate name might not be the Undead Warlock, it might be the Scarecrow, or the Fearmonger, or something along those lines. I'll rest assured that eventually we do end up with more levels in Undead Warlock than anything else, but it takes us a little while to get there, so just be prepared for that as we dive in. Now, 
Let's talk about that fear or that frightened condition that we're sort of building this character around. What does it do exactly? A target that is frightened simply has disadvantage on attacks and ability checks while the object of its fear is in line of sight. It also, the victim also can't willingly move closer to that source of fear. So at first I was thinking, you know, this character would make a pretty great tank, right? But then I think when most of us, when I at least, think of a tank, I think of, you know, a character who is hard to kill, but that who also sort of protects their allies, mostly by encouraging the enemies to attack me instead of them because I can take the hit, right? That's sort of, I think, the, the paradigm of, of the tank. And we can certainly make an undead warlock tanky or, you know, hard to kill. Um, but there's nothing inherent with this fear ability and their other abilities uh, that the Undead Warlock gets that necessarily encourages the enemy to attack them. They can have great control and enemy damage reduction, but if we're talking control and damage reduction, we're sort of more talking support, I think, than tank, right? Now, frankly, these are just semantics, and, and I get that. The way fear protects is that it's via movement control, because the fear target won't move closer to you. So if you are in between the enemy that's feared and your allies, well, you know, if it's a melee enemy, at least, they're not gonna, they're not gonna advance. So that's, that's protecting them, right? But then also, of course, giving the enemy disadvantage on attacks against you and your entire party right, it is also very much a sort of way to protect your team. Of course, if, if the image of this character is, you know, get behind me and, you know, you'll be protected, I will keep you safe by keeping the enemy at bay and by reducing their damage against you, then sure, I mean, you could call it a tank. Um, again, it's semantics. At the end of the day, what the subclass naturally excels at, I think, is control and debuffing. So that's really what I tried to optimize for in the build today. That said, what really surprised me by the end, especially, was just how much sustained DPR damage per round um, the character build could actually put out, while still being a really great sort of tanky support. I was I was sort of expecting to end up being like well below the 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 damage on the tier two list of the sustained damage per round builds that I do. Check them out in the video description if you're not familiar with them. Similar to like the Rune Knight build that I did with Triant Monk a few weeks ago. Uh, there's card number three. Um, that was also focused on being a controller first and like a damage dealer second. The damage ended up surprising me again, particularly by the end, um, and it made the build to me just that much more compelling. Um, let's see if you are equally as pleased. So without any further ado, I present episode 42, The Undead Warlock. Let's jump in. At level one, we are going to start off um, as a paladin for our class at level one. And um, primarily for their proficiencies, especially armor proficiencies, your, your saving throw proficiencies are the same, paladin or warlock. Uh, you get wisdom and charisma, and that's nice. The wisdom especially is nice. Now, um, one thing you need to think about. Are you an evil character? Who is your deity, right? If your plan is to make a pact with an undead being, it might be easiest to be an evil character. I think that in most worlds of D&D that most people play in, um, you know, studying and making packs with undead is probably looked down upon and seen as bad juju. But uh, keep in mind that a pact with an undead being doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be evil. Um, maybe you are a paladin for the god of knowledge, Ogma, and that's how you learned of the undead being that you'll be making your pact with. Um, so think it over. We'll, we'll offer some more suggestions here in a minute. Um, as for our race, we are going to go not custom lineage, not variant human, but dragonborn. Um, I think this is my first dragonborn character I've ever done. Dragonborns are awesome, and I love them. And um, th among other things, they let you choose a draconic ancestry. And this will affect both your once per short rest breath weapon attack that you get to use. You, you use as an action and you make a breath weapon attack that does damage, uh, damage scales as you level. And also the draconic ancestry gives you resistance to the damage type 
uh, you know, that's affiliated with that draconic ancestry, that your breath weapon is also of that damage type, right? So I would suggest going either red or gold, personally, um, for fire resistance and, and fire damage. Um, or green, green's poison damage, but poison resistance. Fire and poison tend to be the most common damage types that other, you know, monsters do, aside from bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, of course. Um, so that's the route that I would go. You do what you want. You could go brass as well if you wanted fire, um, but brass breath weapon is in a line as opposed to a cone. I like the cone better. I think you're more likely to hit more enemies. But again, you know, you may disagree. Pick what you want. Ultimately, we're not actually going to be using that breath weapon all that much. At least, I don't think I would. Um, the main reason we're going Dragonborn isn't readily apparent just yet, so hang tight. As far as abilities are concerned, um, we get a plus two and a plus one, and we can put those wherever we want if you're using Tasha's uh, Cauldron of Everything. And so, assuming, uh, assuming point by, as usual, I'm going to say take a 15 in Charisma and give that your plus two. Um, 13 in Constitution, plus one, so 14 total. Um, a 15 Strength, 12 Dexterity. And then it just leaves you with an 8 Wisdom and an 8 Intelligence. The question is really, do you want one more armor class or do you want one more to your dexterity saving throws and your initiative? I I'm taking armor class and that's why we went with a 15 strength so that ultimately we can wear plate mail armor and not be hindered, not have our movement speed negatively impacted. Um, I know you could go dwarf if you wanted and kind of bypass that sort of, uh, but I really want dragonborn so I don't want to go that route. If you would rather, you could always do like a 13 strength and a 14 dexterity for, you know, one more uh, to your dex save and to your initiative. It would lower your armor class by one, assuming, you know, you got half plate instead of plate mail, but you'd get to add plus two for your dexterity bonus. Anyway, um, you know, you do what you want to do there. I'm, I'm going for the AC. As far as um, equipment, pretty standard stuff. Grab some chainmail, grab a shield, grab a D8 weapon of your choosing, and just stay alive for now. Uh, Paladins at level 1 get Divine Sense, which basically lets you kind of sense the presence of undead and fey and fiends and celestials or something like that. Um, within 60 feet, you can use that a number of times uh, per day. And then, um, of course, you get Lay on Hands, which, as we've talked about many times, is, is a nice little way to, you know, give you some healing. So that's a good support feature. And even, you know, potentially um, sort of get rid of some negative effects on your allies. At level two, we begin our foray into Warlock. So we get, first and foremost, our otherworldly patron, our subclass. And, of course, we are taking the undead patron. Here's what it says. You've made a pact with a deathless being, a creature that defies the cycle of life and death, forsaking its mortal shell so it might eternally pursue its unfathomable ambitions. For such beings, time and mortality are fleeting things, the concerns of those for whom grains of sand still rush through life's hourglass. Having once been mortal themselves, these ancient undead know firsthand the paths of ambition and the routes past the doors of death. They eagerly share this profane knowledge, along with other secrets, with those who work their will among the living. So, again, for many people, and in many worlds, the undead are evil end of story. But maybe, the being you make a pact with isn't necessarily motivated by any nefarious purposes. Maybe the undead that you make a pact with had such a strong desire to do good or right some kind of wrong in this worldly realm after passing that Helm, the god of protection, allowed them to remain uh, after death to continue protecting others. Or Bast, the goddess of vengeance, allowed them to remain until justice was enacted upon some great villain, etc. Um, as a paladin of that god, you had an interaction with this undead being, perhaps, and with your god's blessing, have now become this being's emissary um, to help them fulfill their purpose or quest, etc. I would definitely spend some time with your DM figuring this out. We also get our form of dread now as this uh, undead warlock, and this is this is why we're here. So proficiency bonus times per day, you manifest an aspect of your patron's power. As a bonus action, you can transform for one minute, and it says in a way that reflects some aspect of your patron, so definitely have fun with that. 
Um, and you get a number of features. You get temporary hit points um, equal to a d10 plus your warlock level, which is quite nice early on for us especially. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack roll, and it does not have to be a weapon attack, uh, you, they have to make a wisdom save or they are frightened until the end of your next turn and you are now immune to being frightened yourself. This is so strong. Um, I don't know of another way to so reliably and regularly cause fear in an enemy. Uh, every turn, so long as you're transformed and admittedly, you know, depending on your table, you might not be able to transform for every fight, but I'm pretty sure that most of you We'll be able to do this most, if not all fights, especially once we get our proficiency bonus to three uh, and even four. Now, we also get spells, of course, as a warlock. Um, right now, as a level one warlock, we only have one spell slot, but it resets, resets on a short rest, uh, as all warlock spell slots do. So we get some cantrips. I would take Eldritch Blast for sure. That's gonna be our bread and butter here. Um, and it's a ranged attack. You make a spell attack with it using your charisma modifier, of course. Um, and if you hit, it's a d10 of force damage. And we get to tack on some bells and whistles to it, which we will be doing. And it scales nicely as well. Um, for my other cantrip, I'd probably take Mind Sliver, I think. Um, it, it basically the enemy when you cast it the enemy has to make uh, a an intelligence saving throw which most enemies don't have a very good intelligence save or they take 1d6 psychic damage which scales of course as all cantrips do but then um if they fail their save again they also have a minus 1d4 uh on their next save before your turn so if you've got another caster in your party especially that's going to be making attacks or casting spells that require an enemy saving throw. That's a really nice kind of combo setup for them to help make sure that their spell effect works. As far as first level spells go, I would probably take Cause Fear. It's our first fear spell. Um, so if you wanna be fearing multiple targets, this is a great way to go. Uh, the enemy has to make a wisdom save or they are frightened of you. Um, they get to make a save at the end of each turn. Um, it's only one target, but you can upcast it for an additional target per spell level, which is nice. It requires your concentration, it requires your action. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's just a, a nice way to, to inflict even more fear because you are the fear monger after all. Um, Armor of Agathis is, uh, is nice. Um, I've talked about it before, I won't get into it. It'll help us be a little more tanky. Um, but of course, the temporary hit points that we get from it wouldn't stack with our form of dread, so you know, it wouldn't you wouldn't be using it a ton. Um, the hex spell is is always a go-to for me when I'm playing a warlock. Um, you know, you cast it as a bonus action, and then from then on, when you hit the enemy with an attack, uh, they take an extra one d6 of necrotic damage. Um, you can transfer it to another target if that enemy dies. Uh, the enemy also gets disadvantage on checks with a chosen ability. You choose the ability and then any checks that they make using that ability score um, they have disadvantage on. Of course, fear is already going to give disadvantage on all ability checks, but there may be lots of enemies and you might want to pass that debuff around. Now you do, as an undead warlock, get a couple of spells for free, as it were. Uh, and they are good ones. Um, false life gives you some temporary hit points. Again, not sure how often we'll be using that necessarily, but Bane. Bane is, is fantastic. It's, it's basically the anti-bless, and bless is one of, the best, one of the best buffs in the game, in my opinion, and Bane might be one of the best debuffs. It's, it's definitely really good. It's, it's basically, you cast it um, on three enemies at first level. You can upscale it for more enemies. They have to make a charisma saving throw, which is great. Um, very few monsters in in D and D are going to have a high charisma, um, and if they fail the save, then they have a minus one D four on all of their attack rolls and all of their saving throws, um, meaning that they are less likely to resist your fear if you hit them with this first, right? And the thing that I that I really love about it is, I mean, imagine an enemy that's feared has disadvantage on their attacks, and now they also have a minus 1d4 on their attacks as well. That enemy isn't hitting anybody, and uh, that's awesome. I think if I were playing this character, 
Bane might be my go-to spell for concentration for most of my character's life. Um, Hex if you want more damage, Bane if you really want to lean into the debuffing aspect of the character. At level 3, we are a Warlock 2, and we get a second spell slot, Hooray, really needed that. And then we also get Eldritch Invocations, one of my favorite things about playing a Warlock. Um, so all Warlocks, well, once they hit level 2, get <laughs> Eldritch Invocations. At this level, we only get two of them, so we have to choose wisely. Um, the two that I would recommend would be Agonizing Blast. And Agonizing Blast lets you add your Charisma modifier as damage when you hit with Eldritch Blast, and that's going to be really great for our damage, of course. And then I would also take Repelling Blast. Repelling Blast, when you hit when you hit a creature with your with an Eldritch Blast, you get to push them away from you uh, 10 feet. Alternatively, I'd maybe consider taking Lance of Lethargy, uh, which just slows a target by 10 feet when you hit them with Eldritch Blast, or even Grasp of Hadar, which lets you pull a target towards you 10 feet when you hit them with Eldritch Blast. Um, for now, then, if our Eldritch Blast hits, we can both cause them to be frightened and push them away from us, from our allies, to kind of help control the battlefield and keep people safe. Or, of course, slow somebody or pull them towards you, etc. Wh whichever one you end up choosing. I think I like the push best for now. Um, later on, we'll, we'll make a change to that. At level 4, um, I'm going back to Paladin, and I'm going to be there for a while. I'm, I'm a little torn, to be honest with you, on the level, on the order of levels here. Um, there's a lot in both classes that I really want, but... Uh, if the goal of this character, the primary goal of this character, is to sort of protect allies, reduce damage that they would take, um, I think going Paladin first here is uh, the better route. If you want to go Warlock, go for it. Having completed then a brief period of tutelage with, uh, with our undead patron, um, you now sort of return your devotion a little more zealously to, uh, to your god working maybe in tandem with your patron i would say under your god's direction to accomplish you know whatever great task has been uh, has been set before you but anyway paladins at level two get a fighting style i would take interception i i almost always do it seems like these days when i get a fighting style I, i'd be tempted to go with a defense fighting style that would raise your armor class by one but again if the goal of this character is to protect your allies it's hard to do better than than interception um you know, our AC is already pretty decent once we can afford plate mail anyway. With a shield, we'll have a 20 armor class. The way interception works is if you have an ally that's standing within five feet of you and an enemy makes an attack against them and hits, you can, as long as you have a shield or a weapon, you can intercept 1d10 plus your proficiency bonus of damage uh, for that ally. And it's, it's just fantastic. I mean, you know, your enemies are going to have disadvantage to hit a lot of the times because of fear. Uh, they might have a, a minus d4 to hit as well um, if you're using Bane, and then even if an attack does get through, as long as your ally standing next to you, you can, with your reaction, uh, intercept some of that damage. So it's just really fantastic way to keep your allies from getting hurt. Paladins also at level 2 get Divine Smite. <laughs> it only works on melee weapon attacks. It's a sunk cost. Just move on. I'm sick of Smite anyway, I've been using it a lot lately. Uh, let, let's actually talk about this for a moment. Okay, so could you do a melee version of this build? Sure. Um, if you focused on strength instead of charisma, or dex, I guess, but then you're even more multiple ability score dependent. But anyway, if you focused on a, on a melee stat instead of charisma, um, generally levels 5 through 10 or so you'll be a little bit more damage and you would have the ability to smite for even more damage right um, you'd be more mad you would and and you would basically have to choose between you know doing a little bit more damage or you know spell and fear DC difficulty check among other things um, the Eldritch Blast version, on the other hand, while you give up Smite, um, you don't have a ton of spells anyway, but you give up Smite, sure, but you're, you're going to get to have a shield and a free hand, which means you don't have to worry about Warcaster, right? It gives you a lot of control, a lot of movement. After, from level 11 and on, your, your damage is actually better. 
um, unless you wanted to be a paladin using like a two-handed weapon and get into like great weapon master and polearm master shenanigans, but but now that's like a completely different build, right? Um, one drawback to Eldritch Blast, uh, you know, if they clump up on you, if the enemies clump up on you and they all get within, you know, they get within melee range, um, you're going to be making your Eldritch Blast attacks with disadvantage because it's a ranged attack, right? Now, there are solutions th solutions to this. You could take the crossbow expert feat, which negates um, any disadvantage on ranged attacks if they are within five feet of you. Um, you could, of course, fear and step away if you needed to. And, you know, if you have a 20 armor class and they are feared, um, there's a pretty good likelihood that they're going to miss on an opportunity attack that they make against you. And, of course, you do have ways to fear as they're moving up on you and pushing them back as they're moving up on you. So, uh, you know, I, I don't feel too bad uh, or I don't worry too much, I guess, about, you know, disadvantage on enemies in melee range. And especially as we get higher level and, and we'll, we'll see why as we continue to go. As far as spells, paladins at second level do get first level spells. I would take Bless, and I would probably take Cure Wounds. Um, bless, one of the best buffs in the game. It's basically the opposite of Bane, right? You cast it on three allies, you can upcast it to do more, and now they get a, a D4, they get to add a D4 to their attacks and uh, to their saving throws, which is fabulous. Um, and Cure Wounds, of course, you know, heals for 1D8 plus your Charisma modifier. It's just a nice... Um, you know, easy heal for in between combats or to bring bring an ally up who has gone down, uh, especially if you're all out of your lay on hands pool points. At level five, we are a paladin three. Um, Eldritch Blast now fires twice uh, when you cast it, so you get two beams making two separate attack rolls. Um, you don't have to target the same creature with it, so you could like if you hit one, fear them. Hit another, push them ten feet, right? Uh, which is great. Um, Paladins also at level three get uh, divine health, which makes you immune to disease. Fantastic. Um, and you get your subclass, your sacred oath. And we are going to go oath of conquest. And I know I did that last week, but <laughs> in my defense, um, last week, we we went Oath of Conquest for the for the Rune Knight build. Uh oh, card number four. Um, it was really like right at the end, kind of almost an afterthought. Wouldn't it be crazy if we did this kind of dip thing? Um, we're getting a little more serious about it here. So you have become a, a harbinger of of your god. Uh, it it very well could be in the name of protecting the innocent. But your task, apparently, has become to reduce all who oppose you, your god, and your patron to rubble. <laughs> um, so, we get some oath spells, some sort of free spells for our spell book, as it were. Uh, Armor of Agathus is one, so, you know, maybe don't take that as a warlock spell, uh, since you're getting it here. And Command. Um, command is potentially a nice control spell. It requires an action, no concentration. It only it only lasts for one turn, but uh, you can command your enemy to do a number of things, and they get a saving throw to resist it. Um, but you could you could command them to halt or to flee and run away from you, or to grovel, uh, making them go prone, right, or other things. Um, there, there's probably an entire show, or maybe at least like a sliding into my DMs episode here uh, on like potential one word commands that you could issue using the command spell. Um, I'm sure you could Google it, and I have, and find lots of great suggestions, though. I've seen some that maybe stray a little too far into what would be allowable, I think, at most tables. Actually, I'd love to know your sort of favorite one word commands to use for the command spell. Um, put it in the comments if you wouldn't mind and, and maybe maybe it'll be a quick ruling. Uh, we'll have a, a, a short list of quick ruling uh, you know questions for, for my DMs to see, hey, you know, would you allow this? Why, why not? Um, okay, channel divinity. Paladins get channel divinity, um, which lets you which you can use uh, once per short rest to do some pretty cool things. As we talked about last time, uh, last week, uh, we get guided strike which lets you add a plus 10 to one attack roll. And, and that's kind of why we went with an Oath of Conquest Paladin last week. Um, we're we're kind of kind of ignore it 
this time and focus on Conquering Presence, your other option for your channel divinity. This is fantastic for us. As an action, we can force each creature of our choice within 30 feet of us, which is a huge range, to make a wisdom save or be feared for one minute. They can try again. If they fail, they can, you know, every turn at the end of their turn, they can try that saving throw again. Um, but this is really strong. Uh, so now we have a fear just automatically on our attack each turn on one target. Um, we could potentially cause fear as a spell to hit another target using our concentration. And now we've got this massive area of effect fear as well that we can use just once per short rest. But, but I like to imagine a party of like all ranged characters and, and they're all standing just behind you when you drop this fear bomb. Uh, on your enemies and hit all of your enemies and and potentially you could have a full minute of you and all of your friends just Picking off all of the enemies, you know that they can't move closer to you because they're feared um, And it's awesome, and I love it at level six We are a paladin four and we get an ability score increase or feet and I want to take the dragon fear feet it's only available for dragonborn and it's the main reason why we went dragonborn um, it's a half feet, first of all, so we get to take a plus one to our charisma, which was at 17, so now we're at 18. That's super happy. And now we can spend our breath weapon, if we want, instead of to make you know a damage attack, to roar, forcing each creature within 30 feet of us to make a wisdom save or be frightened for one minute, just like our channel divinity, but with no save, additional save at the end of their turn, which is fantastic. Now... They do get to make a save if they take damage. So if and when you use this, make sure you talk with your friends and say, guys, when I use my Dragon Fear Roar, please don't cast Fireball immediately after, <laughs> right? We want the enemies to stay feared, as many of them as possible. Let's focus, focus down one, one at a time um, so everyone can stay feared, hopefully. And uh, now we have two huge area of effect fears, uh, fear bombs per short rest, which is great. So we're level six, let's do a damage report. First up, I wanna say, I appreciate all of the suggestions that people have been making on the Death Knight video about how to quantify a support character. Um, there are, of course, ways to do it. Um, to be honest, without going into detail, for a variety of reasons, I don't really love any of them. Um, I mean, you could, among other things, you could set up a, a control encounter like I do for my tank builds and sort of pit it against like an ally with a fixed armor class and you know number of hit points just to try and figure out how much you've increased that ally's survivability of, via healing and other various control features and you know damage reduction features and things like that. Again, I, I just I haven't found a system that I like that's that's particularly useful, in my opinion, or simple. There, there, there are so many variables at stake that it's just, anyway, I'm just not a, I'm just not a big fan of, of any that I've come across yet. Maybe I'll find one one day, I don't know. But for now, um, like I did with my Rune Knight build, as I've mentioned, even though we're built primarily for support, let's see what the sustained damage numbers look like, just because it's easy. <laughs> And damage is still important, right? Let's not let's not forget that. At this level, that just means that we're, you know on our turn we're getting two Eldritch Blast attacks per turn at a plus seven to hit and a plus four to damage thanks to Agonizing Blast or Charisma modifier. Um, again, if I were playing this character, I think I would use Bane as my go-to for concentration. I just I love the idea of an enemy having both disadvantage and a minus one d4 to their attacks. But just in case you wanted to pad your damage. Um, because you're already doing a good job of protecting your allies via, you know, the fears, the repelling blast, um, the interception, fighting style, and also because sometimes the best way to protect your allies and yourself is to kill your enemy as quickly as possible. Um, let's assume that you've got Hex going as well for a little bit of extra damage. Um, at level 6 then, damage report f against an enemy with a 10 armor class you would be averaging uh, 24 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it would be 18 damage per round. Exactly the same, actually, as the Rune Knight build. 
at this level. So for a character who is, you know, who's built to control and reduce damage primarily, that's not bad. It's not amazing damage, but I mean, I would argue that, you know, for a character who is, you know, reducing damage and controlling while hurting the enemy, um, I think it's it's pretty good. At level 7, we're Paladin 5. Um, first of all, we get extra attack. <laughs> it feels, I know, it feels like a big, huge, sunk cost waste. Um, because it only works on weapon attacks, right? But think of it this way. We already got our extra attack two levels ago when Elders Blast started firing twice per turn. So you don't need to feel too bad about having extra attack and not actually benefiting from it. Um, we also get second level spells. And so, I mean, it's not like this level is a waste because we do get some nice things from it here. In addition to second level spells, we now have four first level spell slots uh, as a paladin, which is great. Two second level spell slots, four first level spell slots, and two first level warlock spell slots that reset on a short rest. Um, it feels like we've got, you know, a good amount of spell slots and spell casting here that we can do. So I think there are three um, sort of standout spells that you might want to consider taking as a paladin at this level here. Um, aid is fantastic. I've discussed it many times in builds in the past. Um, you know, it's great for support. It lets you uh, add five hit points, five max hit points to um, your allies, up to three allies, I believe it is. Um, and of course, give them five hit points now too. So, you know, you just give them max hit points and then fill up that max hit point. Uh, it scales nicely when you upcast it um, and it stacks with temporary hit points. I realized last week I had a brain fart and, and mentioned that this was temporary HP. I know that it's not, um, but anyway, that's a good one. Lesser Restoration uh, is a solid pick, of course. It lets you cure disease, blind, deafened, paralyzed, or poison on an ally with an action and a touch. And of course, there is the quintessential paladin spell, Find Steed. Um, now, quick note on Find Steed. It lets you summon a, a steed. I would say go with a war horse, and um, it can be really useful. I don't want to get into it too much, but basically, you know, there not there's a question on how it actually functions in game. I think um, not all dungeon masters will agree on you know, how it works in combat. Is it a controlled mount? Is it an independent mount and therefore is able to make attacks? If the latter, um, can you also ride it and have it go where you want and have it attack who you want? Um, I think most people would say yes to all of that uh, latter description, um, but not all DMs will. We, we talked about it at length in uh, a slide into my DMs episode on mounted combat. Check it here. I think that's my fifth card. I'm all out. Oh no. Take a drink. Um, so anyway, check it out if you want to sort of get to, into the nitty gritty of mounted combat and how it works and how fine steed works. But even if all you can do with this mount is just write it as a controlled mount, it's going to give you 60 feet of movement speed, which in and of itself is pretty nice, especially for us. It will really let us more easily position ourselves where we want to be to sort of push our enemies where we want them to be pushed and to get to your allies to intercept damage, etc., etc. And can and the warhorse itself can absorb some damage for you too, which nobody wants to kill their warhorse, but you know, that's that's kind of nice to add to some tankiness there. I am going to assume when I crunch the numbers that that this steed that we have this steed and that they are making attacks for us. Um, obviously, consult with your DM, make sure that that's how it's going to work for you, and if not adjust the damage numbers that I report on accordingly. It's not huge, but it's 2d6 plus 4, so it's not bad. One nice thing too about Fine Steed is it doesn't require concentration. You Once you summon it, it just stays with you kind of forever until you dismiss it or it dies. Um, so like we just need to cast it once and then we get to benefit from it uh, for a very long time, ideally, which is fantastic. Now, um, we also get some great spells for free as a Conquest Pally. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention them. Hold Person is a really strong control spell. Potentially, it only works against humanoids. But if you have a humanoid, um, it requires your concentration, lasts for a minute, they get to make a saving throw, and if they fail it, a wisdom save, um, then they are paralyzed, which means they can't move, they can't speak, they can't take actions or reactions, they automatically fail strength saves, deck saves, and attacks against them have advantage, and any attacker within five feet 
that hits them with an attack automatically. It's an automatic critical hit. That's nasty. And again, great to use if you really need to lock a single enemy down, kill them quickly, especially if you've got melee allies, right? Um, so long as they're humanoid, of course, the enemy that is. Uh, spiritual weapon uh, is is the other one that you get here. It's a, it's a staple for clerics. Um, it lets you summon a spiritual weapon as a bonus action and make melee spell attacks with it. Using your bonus action when you summon it and in sub on subsequent turns, uh, it does 1d8 plus your charisma modifier. It doesn't require your concentration either, which is great. And so I'm going to assume that we actually have this active when we crunch the numbers since we don't have a super regular use of our bonus action in combat right now. And it's a nice little damage bump. You might not want to spell this, spend this spell slot for it right now. But uh, anyway, I'm going to assume that we're using it. At level 8, we are a Paladin 6. And we get Aura of Protection. Oh my goodness, this is a fantastic ability. So you and any allies within 10 feet of you get a bonus to all of your saving throws equal to your charisma modifier which is a four right now um, i think it's one of the strongest support abilities in game frankly the area of effect is is maybe the weakest thing about it it's only 10 feet so hopefully your squishier allies can sort of stay close to you uh, but right now this puts our strength save at a six plus six our deck save at a plus five our constitution save at a plus six, our intelligence save at only a plus three, but our wisdom save at a plus six, because we have proficiency there, and our charisma save at a plus 11. Feels pretty good. Feels pretty good. At level nine, we are a paladin seven. Finally, finally. This is the main reason why I wanted to go into paladin, because we get the aura of conquest. Now, it helped that we picked up some nice um, sort of control and negate enemy damage features along the way, but this was my primary motivator. With Aura of Conquest, as long as you are not incapacitated, an enemy within 10 feet of you that is frightened of you has its speed reduced to zero. And they take psychic damage equal to half of your paladin level, which is only three um, damage if it starts its turn there no save. This, I think, is maybe the strongest if the enemy is frightened ability um, in the game. And it's why I wanted to get this undead warlock and this conquest paladin together so badly because, <laughs> because nobody has a more reliable uh, fear and easy to use fear, I think, uh, than this undead warlock. And so you've got this great, easy to use, always on every turn fear, and this amazing, if an enemy is feared ability, and it is a perfect union of love and happiness, or more like fear and sorrow, I suppose. But anyway, um, with all the fears that you have at your disposal, Dragon Fear, the Cause Fear spell, um, Conquering Presence, Channel Divinity, and your form of Dread Attack, you should be locking down a lot of enemies all over the battlefield and even moving them around a bit while you're at it. And it'd just be awesome to be able to like move up into a group of enemies and maybe use your channel divinity or your dragon fear roar, you know, and if you can get two or three or so enemies that are all just within 10 feet and now they're frozen, they failed their save and they can't move and they're, they can't hit you unless they have ranged attack, but you can still be hitting them with your Eldritch Blasts. And, um, and and it's awesome. Level nine, damage report. Um, again, here we're, we, we have two Eldritch Blasts. Um, our, our proficiency bonus and our charisma bonus has gone up since we checked in last time. Um, assuming we're using Hex for damage purposes, again, I, if it were me, I'd probably use Bane, but in the interest of exploring the possible, um, I'm assuming that we're getting damage from a Warhorse, and I'm assuming that we're using Spiritual Weapon as a bonus action. Um, and that we have, we'll say, two enemies that are feared uh, in our aura. Of course, that's not always going to be the case, but of course, there may be times when you'll have more than two enemies feared in your aura. So anyway, um, you can adjust accordingly. This is pretty much best case scenario or almost best case scenario, right? But at level nine against an enemy with a 10 armor class, um, you would be averaging 50 damage per round against an enemy with a 16 armor class, you would be averaging 36 DPR. Um, again, not amazing, 
but a comfortable lead now actually over my previous sort of control first um, build the rune knight and in fact um, even a little better damage per round than some of my like we're building this character for sustained dpr builds uh, with with some fantastic support and control functionality at level 10 we are a warlock 3 I, I very badly wanted to go Paladin 8 to get my Charisma capped, you know, pick up that uh, ability score increase, but I'm even more anxious to get back to Warlock. Um, so the Charisma is just going to have to wait. At Warlock 3, we get second level Warlock spells, and there's a couple to talk about. Um, Misty Step is fantastic, bonus action, kind of teleport, again to help you with more movement if, um, if, if the steed just isn't getting it done for you. And Phantasmal Force is the other I want to mention. You actually get this for free um, as an undead warlock, uh, as well as Blindness Deafness, which can be good for control too. But anyway, um, Phantasmal Force is cool. It, it, I'm not going to get too into it. It basically is a very powerful illusion spell that can really mess with your enemies' heads and cause them to potentially think that they're stuck somewhere and even maybe do damage to them. Um, and, and so it's very powerful. I, I haven't talked about illusions really ever on this show, which is crazy, I know. It's, it's probably an entire episode or maybe again like a slide into my DMs episode or something. But um, I won't get into all the details of what you can do with Phantasmal Force, but there's a nice synergy here in that um, in order for your enemies to perceive that you have created an illusion, they need to use their action to make an investigation check against your spell DC. If they succeed, the spell ends, but if they're feared first, then they have disadvantage on ability checks, meaning that it will be much easier for you to keep your enemies under the effect of your illusion if they're feared. Um, so that's, that's some nice synergy there. We also, of course, get uh, our Pact Boon as a Warlock 3. And I'm really tempted to go Pact of the Talisman for our purposes. It gives some nice sort of movement and uh, sort of defensive, I think, features for an ally of your choosing that would be wearing your talisman. But I think Pact of the Chain um, is even better here. I, I just I don't feel like I can pass up on it. Um, so when you take Pact of the Chain as your boon, you learn the Find Familiar spell, but you can replace that familiar with some cool, more powerful familiar options like a Pseudo Dragon or a Sprite. Um, if you take the attack action, which we never really do, you can replace one of your attacks to have it attack. Um, the Imp tends to be the go-to, uh, I think, for most Chain Warlocks, but we're going to take the Quasit. Quasite, the Quasit, the Quasite. I think it's Quasit. Anyway, um, for one big reason, it has a once per day fear. Once per day, it can take the scare action, and one creature uh, of its choice within 20 feet of it has to make a Wisdom save or be scared for a minute. Now, the difficulty check is only a 10, but we will fix that later. Um, this frightened enemy can make the save after each turn, but it has disadvantage on the save if the quasit is in line of sight. Um, that's potentially really great. Uh, it will become great here momentarily, I think. Um, it's only once per day, but it is just a nice arrow uh, in our fear quiver. Now, keep in mind that rules as written, this wouldn't work with your Aura of Conquest because um, the zero movement and damage apply when the enemy is frightened of you, and in this case they'd be frightened of your quasit. Uh, your DM, of course, may rule otherwise, in which case, happy days. Um, now, it only has a 13 armor class and 7 hit points, so it's really fragile. It has resistance to a lot of damage types, including bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, but still, 7 hit points, super fragile. Um, but we don't have to attack with it, right? Here's what we probably should be doing with our closet. Um, as an action, it can turn invisible and basically stay invisible kind of forever until it either makes an attack or uses its scare action. So obviously if you use the scare, you know, once per day, then you're going to want to keep it in sorry, keep it visible so that the um, that the enemy it, it has frightened uh, has disadvantage on its on its saves to break that fear. But otherwise, 
Just like any familiar, it can, on its turn, take the help action to grant you or another ally um, advantage on an attack, right? But as far as I can tell, there's no reason that the Quasit can't remain invisible while doing this, while taking this help action. It, it's not going to break you know, uh, the invisibility to just take the help action. It's only broken when it takes the scare or makes an attack. Um, so now your little Quasit can get into all kinds of shenanigans, you know, pulling the helmet down over your enemy's eyes, tickling their bum, I don't know, but, but kind of getting in, taking the help action to distract them, and then getting out without taking an opportunity attack, because you can only take opportunity attacks against a creature that you can see. So as long as the enemy doesn't have like blind sense or, you know, tremor sight or whatever, uh, you should be good. And it will be awesome and hilarious. Um, so now you get this nice advantage and also a once per day fear. Um, I would also recommend that you swap an invocation here. So when you gain a level in Warlock, you can switch out an invocation. Um, I, would, I would take Grasp of Hadar for Repelling Blast. So we no longer can push an enemy when we hit it with Eldritch Blast. The worst thing about Warlocks to me is there are there are too many invocations that I want. Um, I like having difficult decisions on the one hand, but man, I want so many invocations. Grasp of Hadar lets you pull an enemy when you hit them with an Eldritch Blast 10 feet towards you, as I've mentioned. Um, and in, 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 so instead of pushing them away, you're pulling them to you. And while both are great, and ultimately we'll have both, I think that um, thanks to our Aura of Conquest, being able to get enemies 10 feet closer to us is a little more important right now. I can see a lot of scenarios where, say, you know, you run up into a big group of enemies staying, trying to stay 10 feet away from all of them or as many as possible using, you know, your your dragon fear or the cause fear spell or your channel divinity to, to fear a bunch of them. And then they're frozen now if they fail their save anyway. And on your next turn, there may be somebody who's just outside of your range, but you can grab them, hit them with an Eldritch Blast, and pull them and cause them to be feared at the same time. And now they're in your Aura of Conquest too, and, and you can kind of just be like, you over here, you over here. You know, assuming that enemies are, are close enough to, to be pulled to you and, and be within you know that Aura um, would be really cool, and, and you're just sort of collecting bad guys. Uh, over the course of combat while your enemies just pick them all off. We interrupt this undead warlock to bring you level 11. <laughs> Apparently, I forgot to talk about level 11 when I was first recording this. I believe I had been interrupted and skipped it completely. So, Mr. Rogers, who is editing for me, um, let me know about my mistake. So, at level 11, it's actually a very important level. Our Eldritch Blast now fires three times, which is fantastic for both our damage and our control, of course, because it gives us more opportunities to hit targets, move targets, fear targets. Um, and also we get an ability score increase or feat because we are Warlock 4. Did I fail to mention that? We're a Warlock 4. <laughs> and we're going to bump our charisma, of course. So now our charisma is a 20, and that makes us very happy. Um, that's it. Now back to your regularly scheduled Undead Warlock. At level 12, we are a Warlock 5 and we get a third invocation, finally. Um, I really want to get Repelling Blast back, but um, I think what I would do at this level for my third invocation is to actually take Investment of the Chain Master instead. Um, it gives us a number of benefits to our, our, our little um, closet. Uh, it now has a 40-foot fly speed if we want. Um, it can attack using our bonus action if we want. More on that in a minute. Um, its attacks are magical for the purposes of overcoming resistance to non-magical attacks. Um, when it takes damage, we can cause it to have resistance using our reaction, but they already have resistance to fire, cold, lightning, and bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, and they're immune to poison. 
um, and we have a pretty solid re use of our reaction with the interception fighting style already, so I don't imagine using that much. But anyway, um, most importantly for us, and the main reason why, why I'd want to take this, is because when they force a creature to make a saving throw, they get to use our DC, which is a 17 for now. And now that fear is much more reliable than the 10 DC that it, that it normally is as a closet. Um, this also improves their attack um, because they get they there's a poison you know DC or take poison damage associated with their attack. The question is, I guess, should you have your familiar attack now as your bonus action instead of spiritual weapon, right? Maybe. Um, depends on the enemy armor class, depending on their con save or their poison resistance or immunity. It's it's probably going to be slightly worse damage actually uh, to use the closet than it would to use your spiritual weapon, but it's not gonna cost you a spell slot like Spiritual Weapon does. The closet is very squishy. They have a 13 armor class and seven hit points, and even with resistance, they're just not gonna survive for very long, right? On the other hand, we could cast aid, right? We can give them a few more hit points, still probably not enough to really let them live for very long. If, if we're having them attack, then they're not able to take the help action, giving us or one of our allies you know, advantage and a nice benefit to our damage. Um, of course, your DM may not be the type who's prone to attack and kill familiars, especially if they're not doing a ton of damage. And so maybe their fragility isn't that big of an issue. And then again, too, even if your DM does like to attack and kill familiars, I mean, if the object of this character is to sort of absorb damage for your allies, you know, if, if your closet's getting smashed, uh, by an enemy that would have been smashing one of your allies, and you can resummon that closet, uh, you know, for the cost of ten gold in material. But as a ritual later, maybe that's not such a bad idea, especially if you've already used up its fear for the day, right? I'm I'm not sure what to say here. I think probably for me, I would stick with spiritual weapon. I'm gonna assume that we're sticking with spiritual weapon, but having your closet make an attack as your bonus action isn't a terrible option either. You're just gonna have to weigh the pros and cons like I've just done. Um, we also get third level spells, third level warlock spells. Lots of good ones here um, that, I, that I need to mention. Fear is nice. It's, a, it's as an action, requires concentration. Um, 30 foot cone, wisdom save, or the targets are frightened. Um, but with some added perks. Uh, one, they have to drop whatever they're holding, so weapons, shields, etc., um, and take the dash action to move as far away from you as safely possible on their turn. Um, they only get to, they only get to save against this if they get to a place where they don't have line of sight on you. Um, but of course, if they're within 10 feet of you when you first cast it, they're not going to be able to move, right? They're going to be frozen by your aura. It's a potentially really great um, get enemies away and, you know, cause them fear. It's good control, good damage resistance, absorption, whatever you want to call it. My, my favorite spells to talk about at this level actually are Counterspell and Dispel Magic, but not because we get any special benefit from them other than their amazing spells to cripple enemy spellcasters and spell effects. Um, but but I like I want to just mention them briefly because of um, how we sort of benefit if an enemy spellcaster tries to use them against us or one of our spellcaster allies, right? So as you probably know, if if um, an enemy spellcaster uses counterspell against you at a spell level that is lower than the spell you have cast, then they have to make a an ability check using their spellcasting ability against the DC, which is the spell level plus 10, right? But of course, as we know, if that caster is feared, they're going to have disadvantage on their ability checks. So if you're up against enemy spellcasters, try to make sure that you fear them first and constantly, if you can, um, so that they can't shut down you or your friends uh, by you know throwing out a counter spell or a dispel magic. Um, they'll have disadvantage on that on those on those counter spell and dispel magic checks. So that's great. The most important spell for us, I think, at this level is uh, spirit shroud. Um, 
I think the Spirit Shroud spell might be the biggest argument that one could make for, for getting to Warlock 5 sooner and delaying those Paladin levels instead. Uh, especially if you're more interested in damage than you are in sort of control and protection for your allies. Um, Spirit Shroud, super fantastic. So bonus action to cast, requires your concentration, lasts for a minute, and then every attack you make to an enemy within 10 feet does an extra d8 of either radiant, necrotic, or cold damage, your choice. And any creature you hit and that takes this extra damage um, can't regain hit points until the start of your next turn, so great to shut down healers or, you know, if there's a healer in the, in the enemy party. And any creature of your choice within 10 feet at the start of its turn has its speed reduced by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. So many wonderful benefits with this spell, right? Um, as for the 10 feet requirement, like you only get the damage and things if they're within 10 feet of you, not a huge deal, I don't think, because again, for the most part, you're going to want your enemies that you're attacking to be within 10 feet of you so that they're within your aura, right? Um, and now, if you can't quite fear everyone, somebody makes their save or something against your fear, um, on people that are within 10 feet of you, at least now you can slow them. Um, and that's fantastic, both for control and damage. They're, they're going to be slowed by 10 feet, and so on their turn, if they try to move away from you to get to an ally, well, they'll probably not be able to get too far, and you'll be able to grasp of Hadar, you know, move them back towards you. They'll be slowed, um, potentially feared now, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Spirit Shroud is great, and, and better also, uh, sorry, less demanding of our action economy than Hex was, because with Hex, every time an enemy died, you had to transfer it, you know, use a bonus action to transfer it, now we cast it once at the beginning of combat and just we get to benefit from it uh, for the rest of combat. Um, you still might want to use Bless or Bane or Fear or Cause Fear or something else for your concentration. I think if I were playing this character at this point, I would use Spirit Shroud because of the great damage, but also the you know little bit of control uh, and slow and things that you get. It's just a really powerful spell. At level 13, we are a Warlock 6, and we get the next feature in our Undead Warlock suite, um, Grave Touched. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. Ew. <laughs> That's creepy. You're, you're becoming more and more like your patron. I, I hope your, your skin isn't starting to slough off or something. Um, but also, once during each turn, when you hit and damage a creature with an attack roll, you can replace this type of damage with necrotic, if you want. And if we're using our form of dread, which will hopefully be every fight for most of us, I would think, at this point, um, you can roll one additional damage die when determining the necrotic damage, which is pretty great. It's almost like a free critical once per turn, right? Um, just in time for a level 13 damage report. So at this point, our damage has, has gone up significantly. Um, we are hitting with Eldritch Blast three times for a d10 plus five. Um, one of those hits gets an extra d10 of damage. Uh, we'll assume your, your Quasit is giving you advantage on one of those attacks, although of course y your party may very well be better off giving advantage to someone else in your party. I can't know that. Um, but all of those attacks would benefit from a d8, an extra d8 from Spirit Shroud, plus a spiritual weapon attack as a bonus action, plus a warhorse attack, I'm assuming, um, plus two enemies taking uh, some aura damage uh, by being in your aura. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, you would do 76 damage per round on average. And against an, en an enemy with a 17 armor class, you would be doing 61 damage per round on average, all while immobilizing, fearing, slowing, pulling, and intercepting damage. Um, Dang, did I say this wasn't going to be a sustained damage per round build? Level 14, we are a Warlock 7. Um, we get a fourth invocation. I'm probably taking Lance of Lethargy. Um, there are lots of good options still, of course. Uh, the thing that, the reason, the main reason I want Lance of Lethargy here, as opposed to Repelling Blast again, um, is that you use this and when you hit him with an Eldritch Blast, you can slow them by 10 feet and it's really nice because it would potentially stack with your spirit shroud, making one enemy slowed, you know, almost to a point where they can hardly move. Um, getting Repelling Blast, of course, would be nice for another way to control the battlefield. Um, I would also love to have Eldritch Mind 
for advantage on our concentration check. So if you find yourself dropping concentration a lot, it's worth considering. I would think with a with a 20 armor class, and I mean, that's assuming no magical armor or magical shields, which you probably have by now, um, but also a plus seven now to our constitution saves. Um, we should be okay on our concentration checks, but that's gonna depend on your table and your dice. <laughs> so if we're going for pure survivability, uh, Gift of the Ever-Living Ones would be nice as well. Um, when you roll dice to recover hit points, whether through a heal spell or even like during a short rest and you're spending hit dice, you treat each die as being rolled for, you know, its maximum amount. Um, that's kind of amazing. So feel free to go that route if you feel like your control options are good enough and, you know, you really want to bump your survivability. You've got, you know, some dedicated heals going on in your party, etc. Um, we also get 4th level Warlock spells here, and um, there are, of course, some good ones. Dimension Door is super fantastic for movement for you and even potentially an ally. Um, Banishment can be a pretty good control option, though it requires concentration. Um, Upcasting Bane, or Bless here for that matter, would let you cast it on up to 6 enemies or 6 allies, uh, which would be super nice if you needed it. Um, I want to talk about Death Ward. So, Death Ward is one of the spells that you get for free as an undead warlock. And it's a very powerful spell. Um, you touch one creature as an action, and then for eight hours, concentration free, the first time that they would drop to zero from taking damage, um, they instead drop to one, and the spell on them ends. Um, if there's an effect like Power Word Kill, it is just simply negated, which is awesome, right? Um, here's the great thing about having this and other similar long-duration spells as a Warlock. Uh, your spell slots, keep in mind, reset on a short rest. So this and like the Aid spell, for example, which also lasts for 8 hours, should, should always be cast using your Warlock spell slots um, before you take a short rest. If you have any Warlock spell slots left, make sure you're buffing yourself and or your allies with, with these spells. Um, because, of course, after your short rest ends, you get your spell slots back, and now you and or your allies have seven hours left of this buff on you, which is fantastic. Um, you could, if you wanted to be super cheesy, you know, technically cast it again on more allies and take another short rest, and then, you know, and now some of you have it six hours and some of you have it seven hours. I I have a hard time believing that most DMs would just let that go more than once or twice before they were like, okay, every short rest you get interrupted now by random encounters, <laughs> so be careful. At level 15, we're a Warlock 8, and we get another ability score increase or feat. Um, this is a little bit of a tough call for me. I'd probably bump Constitution to 16 just to increase our survivability, our saving throws. Um, but an alternative suggestion would be to, to consider taking the telekinetic feat. Um, here's the problem. So telekinetic is cool because it lets you, as a bonus action, potentially move another creature five feet. Um, they get a strength save against it, which isn't great. And five feet isn't huge either. But considering all the other ways you have to move and pull and slow, it might be just enough for your purposes, right? To maybe get them back inside your aura or something like that. Um, here's the problem with it. You, you increase either your wisdom, your intelligence, or your charisma by one with it. And the, the, the ability score that you increase is what, is, is what dictates the difficulty check um, for the monsters to try and resist this movement. And our ability, our charisma is capped already, so we couldn't take charisma, I don't think. Depending on your DM may say, fine, you can say charisma, but I'm not actually going to let you take your charisma to 21 or whatever. But otherwise, if we're if we're bumping our wisdom or, or our intelligence, our DC is going to suck. So if you're going to do telekinetic, you probably need to do it sooner. Maybe just have a lower charisma score, which is a bummer. Or maybe don't even go dragonborn, go something else. And, you know, don't take dragon fear then and take this way back when to get your charisma to 18. Um, I'd, I'd rather go the way that we're going and just bump charisma, or sorry, bump constitution, I think, at this point. At level 16, we're Warlock 9. We get a fifth invocation, and finally we're going to get Repelling Blast back here, I think, um, for some additional uh, battlefield movement control. Um, of course, again, you could take Gift of the Ever-Living Ones if you want for survivability and, and buffs to, to healing. 
Um, we get fifth level spells, and there's there's just too many good ones to, to talk about at length here. Um, the fact that you get two fifth level spells on a short rest uh, is in and of itself really amazing as a, as a level nine warlock. Um, so hold monster is the upgraded version of hold person, right? Working on all creatures, not just humanoids now, which is, as we've mentioned, potentially really strong. Um, Anti-life shell is one that you get for free as an undead warlock, which can be great um, for protection for you and allies close to you, keeping enemies from getting in, uh, getting close to you, or potentially you could use it to trap enemies close to you if they weren't undead, right? And they can't get out of the shell. What? That could be cool, especially with your aura and your fear. The one that I really wanted to talk about is Synaptic Static. So it's like a fireball in that it does 8d6 damage in a 20-foot radius sphere. Although fireball, if cast at 5th level, would do a little more damage. It would do 10d6. This does 8d6. But um, it's better than fireball in that it requires an intelligence save instead of a dexterity saving throw to see if you take half damage which is more likely to be failed by most enemies. And if they fail the save, for one minute, they have to subtract a d6 from their attacks and their saves and their concentration checks. So perfect for us. Um, now, we could potentially throw out synaptic, well, throw out Bane, throw out synaptic static, and now um, enemies are getting a, they're subtracting a d6 and a d4, from from all of their attacks and if they're feared they have disadvantage your dm would hate you so much nobody's hitting anything they 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 will they will be throwing dice at your face and you will laugh and then they'll think of some mean way to kill you but it will have been worth it just lots of great ways to to debuff our our enemies you know and we could just use spirit shroud throw out a synaptic static um, still keep Spirit Shroud up, and now we don't feel so bad about you know not using our concentration for Bane because we've still done a great job of debuffing our enemies. Fun, fun, fun. And finally, at level 17, you could go Pally 8 if you really wanted another ability score increase or feat here, but that's boring. So we're going Warlock 10. And uh, we get, regardless of, of the choice, we get our Eldritch Blast firing four times now, which is amazing. Um, and not only that, but with one blast you can push somebody, with another you can slow somebody, with another you can pull somebody, with the fourth you can fear somebody. Um, so fun. But then we also get Necrotic Husk, um, which is simultaneously my favorite and least favorite ability <laughs> that the Undead Warlocks get access to. So. Um, you have resistance to necrotic damage. If you're transformed with your form of dread, you have immunity to necrotic damage. And in addition, when you would be reduced to zero hit points, you can use your reaction, so make sure you save your reaction if you're almost dead, uh, to instead drop to one hit point and cause your body to erupt with deathly energy. Um, each creature takes necrotic damage equal to 2d10, plus your warlock level, so that's gonna be 21 damage on average. No saving throw or anything, they just take that damage and you explode in the gory mess. Um, I mean, it could just be an energy mess, but I imagine it would be a gory, bloody one. Anyway, um, you get one level of exhaustion, which if you don't have any other levels of exhaustion is just disadvantage on ability checks for us right now, which isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, this is so amazing, <laughs> and, and once you use it though, you can't use it again for 1d4 long rests, which, is a real bummer. I mean, admittedly, you shouldn't be going down to zero, you know, that often, especially at this level, especially if you have Death Ward. And speaking of, I don't know why you couldn't have Death Ward on yourself as well. And the first time you go to zero, you just go to one hit point and Death Ward's done. And then your enemy's like, oh, dang it. Well, we've got you this time. And you explode <laughs> and you're still standing. Um, it's hilarious and awesome and silly and risky and um, gross. It would be so great to end a fight, a big fight with this, where, you know, it's like close and people are almost dead and your enemies are almost dead and they hit you with a what they think is a killing blow and instead you just explode and, and kill them instead and you're still standing there covered in gore and ichor. <laughs> awesome. Final damage report, level 17. It has us making four Eldritch Blast attacks for 
d10 plus 5. One of those gets an extra d10, uh, again, assuming that the closet is giving you advantage on one of those. Um, all of them benefiting from actually a 2d8 from Spirit Shroud. If we wanted to, we could upcast it to a 5th level spell here for 2d8 for each hit. Um, plus a Spiritual Weapon attack, which we could also upcast for a 2d8 per hit on our bonus action, which you should assuredly not do. Don't waste your 5th level Warlock spell slot <laughs> for this. But anyway, we're exploring what's possible, so scale it back a teeny bit. Um, unless you just want to go all out and be crazy. Uh, plus a Warhorse attack, plus two enemies, taking a little bit of aura damage again. Against an enemy with a 10 armor class, you would be doing 114 damage per round. And against an enemy with an 18 armor class, you'd be doing 90 damage per round. Holy crap, we broke the Centennial Barrier. Um, with a build, again, that I was fully intending to use primarily as like a support damage absorption control. Um, of course, there would be things that would bring this damage down, right? Giving the Quasit's help to another ally will bring it down a smidge. Um, your Warhorse not being able to make attacks every round and or dying, for that matter, um, bring it down a smidge. Uh, deciding to use Bane or Bless or some other concentration spell instead of Spirit Shroud obviously is going to bring it down pretty significantly. Um, <clears throat> not upcasting your spells, etc., etc. Still, th this is kind of what's possible. And even if you did have to bring it down, you know, let's say you, you didn't you have Spirit Shroud going, that would be a pretty significant reduction. Um, it's still really good damage and really good damage debuffs and control too while you're at it. So, final thoughts. Um, in case you didn't know, I, I keep track of um, my sustained damage per round builds in two separate spreadsheets, the tier spreadsheets. Check the video description to see them. Um, and this build ends up being tied with a tier score of 52 at the very top of the tier two um, builds tied with uh, the Spore Beast and the Moon Druid, which I don't have enough cards to link to right now. <laughs> um, I mean, what is with the high damage supporty type characters lately, right? Uh, so I guess I need to put this character in there uh, with, the, with the other two tier two damage builds. Um, even though, again, you know, my original goal with them was just to kind of make them more of a support type character. Um, I'm gonna have to probably make a third tier here pretty soon because because those those graphs and spreadsheets are starting to get crowded. Um, I love the story of this character. I really do. I love also the ability to do great damage and simultaneously um, have some really strong debuff and control options. Incredibly powerful character, I think, and I really wish that that this sub subclass were official content. Um, when I created my Warlock that I'm now playing in our Tales of Venaria campaign right now. But I guess I'll just have to wait uh, and play it with all of the other, you know, 41 characters that I want to be playing right now in Dungeons & Dragons. So anyway, that's our show for the week. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys. You are fantastic, and um, I really, really appreciate you. Uh, if you haven't, please like and subscribe and comment, and consider joining the channel as well. And um, I hope you have a fantastic day, and we'll see you soon.